We're here with Tom Keller, also Eugene. And our topic today, we're going to talk about Hinduism, Buddhism, and Zen. Yeah. You can call them like the Dharmic religions. We've talked about my testimony and Drew and I were talking this week just about how to like evangelize people that come from like a Hindu Buddhist background. And I mean, we talked about maybe some physical alterations. I've actually started lasering some tattoos, but I have a big Om symbol coming out of like a lotus flower covering my forearm. I have the six paramitas of bodhisattva tattooed on my chest. But, you know, like many people in the West, I didn't really know what I was doing with that. Wow. And I, I got it done upside down by accident and only half of them. <laughs> oh, man. So that, that kind of, yeah. it, it kind of, it's a good segue into why we're doing this. Because mm. <laughs> a lot of people I talk to in the West, you know, they think they kind of understand these things. And I thought I did, but it's yeah. like upside down and only half of it, you know. <laughs> Well, Tom, first of all, we should take a picture of these tattoos on your chest and we'll post it for people to, as proof that we were serious. There's no joke. <laughs> so let me set this up. I was uh, hanging out with a friend who has a Hindu background and I was like, oh, I don't know that much about Hinduism. And that Saturday, Tom randomly calls me while I was hanging out with this friend that has a Hindu background. And we got in this conversation like an hour, two hours. And I was like, oh my God, Tom, you know so much. It's like amazing. You know how, let's say, immigrants that become American, they become more American than Americans. <laughs> and Because <laughs> that's how I got to see Tom is like the Hindu of Hindus because he didn't have that background. He just like full on studied it. He's like a Hindu nerd yeah. that now has come to find Christ and become a follower of Christ and believes in the Bible as the word of God now. Yeah. And so we, I thought, I was like, okay, hey, we need to glean from his testimony yeah. with regards to Hinduism and Buddhism because they're tied together. How did you get involved with Hinduism, Buddhism? I had a friend when I was a kid in fifth grade. I'm not sure if he really knew so much about Buddhism, but I think his mom was really interested in it. And so he like started talking to me about Buddhism. And I think in my fifth grade library, I found like the complete idiot's guide to Buddhism. It's like Buddhism for dummies or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I read the whole thing. And there used to be like a Himalayan store, a store of all just like Buddha figurines and statues and incense and like run by these Tibetan people like by my elementary school. And I used to go hang out there and buy little statues and incense and think I was so smart and cool. And it was something different. And for years, I really read about this stuff. And a lot of my journeys in my own kind of mental health journey. I just went through so much like mental health care and a lot of Western mental health care is based on Eastern practices, especially a lot of Buddhist stuff and like yoga. It's just like dominates the mental health world in the West because people, it's very trendy and cool. And then in college studying different religions, read Mahabharata and sacred Hindu texts and the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and the Dhammapada and all these sacred texts. And I was traveling around, went to India and all around Southeast Asia where you're visiting all these huge mega Buddhist temples. and stuff. Okay, what's the difference between these texts? Maharta, Vada man, I can yeah. never get it, dude. Yeah. I practiced it so many times. It's like too. five consonants in a row. I know, uh, I can't believe you just ripped that <laughs> off. Like, Yeah. So what's the difference between the, those texts? Yeah, the Mahabharata is kind of like ancient Greek mythology, how the Iliad and the Odyssey and stuff. It's kind of like that. It's like this huge ancient Indian epic, and it tells the story of the world, how it came to be, kind of like the Genesis account for Hindus. And then within that, there's a part of it, it's like this super fat book, and it, within it, there's a part of it called the Bhagavad Gita, which is just like one of the stories in it, but it's considered the most sacred of the Hindu text, Bhagavad Gita. And it's basically this warrior is about to go to war and he turns out that his chariot driver is a god undercover boss, like Vishnu is pretending to be his chariot driver. And they have this epic conversation where he has this mega theophany experience, kind of like Daniel or Ezekiel or something. Okay. Very, actually very, very similar. Got it. You know, like Dr. Strange, the lady like hits him in the head and he goes into like this crazy trip and there's eyes and arms and yeah. he's like flying through space. It basically like that happens to this warrior. Kid's spiritual eye gets open to like the ultimate reality of the universe and sees God and God's throne and everything. Nice. Then they have this kind of theological debate where God says to him, the only answer to all this is God's grace. You can't strive to like enter God's space. Mm. 
Sounds familiar. Yeah. I think to start this conversation, Christianity, when it started, it, it did expand East. And I think it's funny, I'm Tom, Thomas, the disciple, you know, put his finger in the holes of Jesus side and stuff, mm. went to India and evangelized India and was martyred there. So there's churches in India that were founded by Thomas that have been there ever since. It's one of the oldest denominations. It's like this old strand of the church that's been there since the time of Thomas. Whoa. So that is so cool. <laughs> Tom, Thomas. That's great insight, Tom. Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism. You met somebody that was Buddhist. Yeah. And then when I was kind of going through my journey of all these different kinds of therapists and mentors, a few of them introduced me to Buddhist practices and Zen practices. Others introduced me to yoga. Also used to do some Hindu practices like worshiping Hindu gods and things like that. But got pretty mm -hmm. deep into it. Got really into this Tibetan practice of chud which is kind of like the you know idea of manifestation, kind of this pop do age thing. But you know all these things in Hinduism and Buddhism, it's been around for thousands of years. So they have books and books and books and books on this stuff, and all the theology is built out. As much as you know, you think of Christianity, like how much it's changed mm. with writers and different strands of theology and denominations. There's as much of that stuff in Hinduism and Buddhism. It's like very, very rigorously defined. Mm. Mm. But just to go back to origins too, they're all related to each other, right? Yeah. Like, so Buddhism is an Indian offshoot of Hinduism, yes, right? And then Zen is a Chinese offshoot of Buddhism, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of morphed off into Taoism and other stuff, but mm -hmm. that's exactly what it is. And, you know, it's kind of like there's a difference between the Coptic church in Egypt and some super non-denominational Western Christian. Yeah. It's like Eastern Orthodox mm -hmm. or Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's the Protestants that Or the guy that off. just likes to go to his coffee shop and like, you know, read the Bible, reads the message translation. And I love the message translation. <laughs> you know, but you know, it's like you have you have like the super strict Orthodox, very mystical, yeah. regimented mm -hmm. monastic people. And then you have like the guy that's like kind of interested in the sort of philosophical ideas. And you have that whole range. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you started off being interested in Buddhism and then it took you on this rabbit trail. Yeah. It's understandable. You know, there's a movement now where people like hate Western culture, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah. I need to find something different, man. I'm just so sick of the Western worldview. So you find like Buddhism or Hindu, it's like, man, this is so cool. Yeah. Fulfill some of these missing parts in my own yeah. identity that I've never even thought about. And then you just went into that full on, right? And I think that's just a symptom of, yeah, Thomas went East, but Christianity kind of like morphed with the Roman Empire and took on a lot of these Roman things and the hierarchy and the structure and it ended up going to Europe. But I was listening to a pastor friend of mine who spent a lot of time in Nepal and people in Nepal, they're just very wary of Christianity and have all these anti-conversion laws and stuff. And it's like, you know, you get arrested because they're like, we don't want this Western religion coming into our country. And he's like, it's not Western religion. It's not. Uh. Abraham is from Ur, which is like Kuwait, Basra, Iraq. And then you go 2,000 miles on a road through Iran and you get to like Karachi and Hyderabad, Pakistan. That's where Hinduism is from. One to 2,000 miles apart mm. on like a single highway. These things are not far from each other. Mm. You know, like Christianity and Judaism are not different. And I do want to talk about that a little bit. Like, we have this like super regimented, reformed theology, philosophical kind of view of Christianity that's taken it away from this original, super mystical kind of cosmology. Mm. If you just read Genesis, read Ezekiel, read Daniel, go read the Hindu things, it's like nearly identical. And, you know, you look at the creation stories, they're all identical. Wow. Even in China, like ancient China, before Buddhism came around, maybe 500 years before Buddhism came around. Ancient China, they believed in one single God called Shangdi, who had all the characteristics of Yahweh. They had like excerpts of the Psalms written down by like ancient Chinese kings. Even the gospel and the Genesis account can be found in the pictorial alphabet of the Chinese alphabet. Wow, that's a cool thesis. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting stuff like the Tower of Babel, the garden, all these things are built into like the pictures of the Chinese language, just like the Hebrew language. You can like take apart the letters and it's like pictures that you put together into letters and it tells the story. 
Yeah, because creation is the pool by which these philosophers take and build these worldviews, right? So it's in a sense, everyone is taking from the same pool, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And building out different interfaces or words, yeah. just using different language yeah. and different pieces from the creation that they're observing. Moses went up, saw God, and wrote the first, you know, five books of the Bible, like wrote the whole creation account. Pentateuch. Yeah, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and God like gave him the real story. But then you have the rest of the world that's experiencing the exact same cosmological spiritual reality, has witnessed the exact same story going on, but they have like uninspired minds, their own pagan cultures, you know, but they're all talking about the same thing. Wow. And that's something I wanted to like talk about. You look at all these religions, and if you really get into like some deep cosmology stuff, yeah, it's all like the same. Okay, let's go into this, Tom. You see, keep saying it's all the same, but you're not saying I can be a Hindu and a Christian is the same. No, it's like the Bible's creation account. If that's the true story, everyone else is kind of their own version of it. Like, for example, you have the New Testament and then later on, like Muhammad shows up and has his version of it. You know, it's like his commentary on the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's very different, but it's still like based on the, the truth, the same, the one true account. That's right. And Mormons are the same where they, yeah, yeah, they say, oh, Jesus is Lord. But when they say Jesus is Lord, it's a different Lord. It's not second person mm -hmm. of the Trinity. It's yeah. Jesus was a misunderstood Jewish peasant that lived a very virtuous life and was an amazing prophetic voice that should be followed. But their idea is not necessarily what the New Testament and the apostles have, yeah. have yeah. testified about who Christ is. So they, in a sense, they have a piece of the pie that's true but maybe not the essential core. Which is what draws people into, you know, the Eastern religions, because at their core, there's elements of deep spiritual truth. And it's enough, it brings you in, but the prognosis and diagnosis are very different. The answer, the problem really is the same, and they all talk about these same problems. Nice. What are the basics of Hinduism? So God in Hinduism is this thing called Brahman. And mm -hmm. it's the one universal soul, formless, kind of genderless source of all reality. It's the universe itself and the material that makes up the universe. So it's kind of like there's an ocean and we're all like drops in the ocean. So just from there, it's kind of this monotheistic thing. It's a lot like Yahweh and how they talk about it is a lot like talking about Yahweh, except Yahweh is not like string theory where everything is just this vibrating energy that's all one essence. It's like Yahweh is sovereign and distinct from his creation, but lives outside of our universe. He's outside of the system, right? Yeah. Whereas Brahman is the system and like, you know, all of our atoms are also part of Brahman. So, you know, there's some fundamental differences where it's like the whole point of Hinduism is this thing called moksha where you are just supposed to realize that you are part of Brahma. Liberation. Yeah, like you suddenly realize, oh, oh, wow, I'm actually part of this giant universal cosmic divine being. And the whole point of it is your soul, your, which is called your Atman, is like you have this unique individual immortal soul is going on this journey of moksha to be returned into union with Brahma, which is the divine God, but is also part of reality. So... You know, as a Christian, I believe there is this divine being, this eternal omnipresent being, but I have been eternally separated from him. Whereas in Hinduism, you've only been like consciously separated from him. Mm. But there, it, there's all these like similarities with Christianity where it's like, you know, Jesus says, you're my body. Well, there's a caste system in Hinduism that's divinely ordained. You were born into this caste system. And those pieces of the caste, they're said to be different parts of Brahman's body. Wait, Jesus said, you're talking about this is my body? He says like the church is his spiritual body. Oh, okay, got it, got it. So this is not a foreign concept to Hindus who believe that every single person who's born is born into a divinely created social caste system. And each of those castes represent part of Brahman's body. Mm. Whoa. And Jesus says, you know, in that day, you'll realize that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and, you know, all that. It's yeah, like, the, John you know, 17. Oh, I have this realization that I'm in Christ. But we start off, because of the fall, eternally disconnected from God. And our only way to 
go on this journey to be brought back into union with God is through Christ, Mm -hmm. through faith in Christ. Whereas that doorway isn't there. There's no like set idea of what that journey is. Well, it's karma, right? It's karma. Well, karma is like all your actions, good and bad, have eternal consequence. And they believe in reincarnation, which is called the transmigration of souls. So if I'm really bad on this earth, that's going to determine what body my soul is going to be reincarnated into. And it's like you spend this sort of eternity going from body to body to body on your journey to be back reunited with Brahma. Mm. And moksha is basically breaking out of the cycle of yeah. reincarnation. Yeah, exactly. Eventually. Yeah. And that, that's kind of what the Buddha talks about. You know, the Buddha was a Hindu king named Siddhartha Gautama, though there's, there's like, we don't have the same like evidence that this was a real guy. But basically, he was a born a Hindu prince. There was a prophecy he was supposed to be this great religious leader and not a king. And the dad's like, I want him to become a king, so I'm going to make sure there's no suffering in his life. Well, eventually, this guy wanders out from the castle and sees a poor person, old person, and a dead person. And is like, oh my gosh, there's suffering. So basically, the Buddha goes on this moksha journey. He goes out into the forest for six years and with all these ascetics and starves himself and fasts and does all these forms of yoga, and then he realizes he's really hungry and none of it worked. So he goes and sits under a divine tree. And under this tree, he reaches nirvana enlightenment. Nirvana is the end goal of Hindus and, and Buddhists, that you've broken out of this cycle, you've consciously been kind of absorbed back into this divine being, and you know union has been restored. But Hindus have no like one way to get there. There's ritual sacrifice. The Brahmin priests do all these sacrifices to keep the gods happy. And, you know, you can go do like hours of yoga or like all these ascetic practices. It's not like they've decided there's one way to get back to God. They've said, okay, the problem is that we are consciously separated from God and we need to get back there. But there's like 30 million Hindu sub-deities and you can worship them all. And that's all part of your journey back to union with God. So they don't really have like a set path. Buddha said, there is a set path. It's the Eightfold Noble Path. You have the Four Noble Truths saying like there's suffering. So you've really helped me to see some of the nuances now. And I've had some misconceptions about Hinduism because I assume that they're like, oh, all these different gods and almost like polytheistic view that you worship all these different gods. But it's actually, no, there's one God, it's Brahman, but they also recognize the other gods. But they're like kind of under Brahman. Yeah, so. Yeah, which is not different from the Bible. But even Jesus is considered under Brahman. Well, from their perspective, because that gets into, so Krishna, who was this like divine warrior on earth, they say was like the incarnation of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. Vishnu is like, there's kind of like a Hindu trinity, you know what I mean? There's Brahman, Vishnu, and Shiva. Uh And they're kind of like the head honchos. And there's three of them. And the three of them kind of like sustain the universe. And it said, you know, the same way we think of like Jesus being like an incarnation of Yahweh, Krishna was an incarnation of Vishnu. So they say, oh, Jesus was just another incarnation of Vishnu. Let me summarize. So Hinduism is not monotheistic or polytheistic. It's called henotheistic, which means Mm. they worship a single deity, the Brahman, but still recognize other gods and goddesses. And so Hindus believe there are multiple paths to reaching their God. Yes? Yeah. The problem is that we're like not in conscious union with God, but there's no like single agreement on how we get there. The Buddha shows up and he tries all the different ways that Hinduism offers, doesn't find an answer, goes and sits under the holy Bodhi tree and has an experience of enlightenment. But he himself admitted, he's like, I'm just a human and this is the best, (laughs) the best I have to offer you based on my experience. He reaches the state of nirvana, which is like the goal of Hinduism and Buddhism. But it's like, he says, you know, the best you have is the Eightfold Noble Path. You know, that's how you get there. Yeah, yeah. The Buddha was originally a Hindu Mm -hmm. that was frustrated with Hinduism and sought more enlightenment, and then a clearer path towards access to God, right? Yeah. And then that's where the Eightfold Paths came in. That's correct? Yeah, which is very hard. 
It's like it starts with right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness. First of all, okay, maybe right view <laughs> is is easy, but like 30 minutes of being awake in the morning, I've already, I'm like done at step four. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and, and I like how you're saying right view is the easy one, man. That doesn't sound like anything but, yeah, so, <laughs> anything but easy. I don't, exactly, no, it doesn't. <laughs> And there's a famous Buddhist like mural and it's of this big ocean and there's a ring floating on the top of the ocean and a turtle whose head has come up from the ocean and gone up through this ring. And they say that the chances of you actually reaching enlightenment by doing all these things is the same chance that if my wedding ring was floating in the Pacific Ocean somewhere randomly and by total chance, a turtle just happened to be coming up for air that his head would come up into that ring. So that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the assurance. That sounds entirely discouraging. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And Hinduism says, well, we don't actually know how you get restored to Brahman, but you can do yoga, which the word yoga means yoke. And both of them kind of have the same idea that to break out of that system, you have to realize that basically everything is just a mental construct, mm. you know, and that you're grasping, you're lusting and grasping and thirsting after all these things that don't actually mean anything. And you have to like suppress or let go of your attachment to all earthly things. Mm. Now, unfortunately, there's no limit to that. Like if you actually want to reach nirvana, that means including completely demolishing your attachment to everyone you love all your possessions, all your mental concepts of everything, the world completely. And Zen is sort of like been, you know, a few iterations out. And it's kind of like this, you know, you reduce your suffering by like, I release my attachment to like the things I cling to, which, you know, that's like, it's good therapy, you know what I mean? But it never provides an answer mm. for like cosmic justice. There's no redemption. You just kind of like have to just slowly detach yourself from everything and kind of fade off. And Zen, you know, detaches from like Brahman and everything. It's more just this tahata, like the suchness. You just kind of fade off into the ether by detaching from everything. Mm. So it doesn't actually like answer the question, you know what I mean? That yeah. Here's a way you can reduce suffering. And like the noble truths are like, there is suffering. Yes, there's suffering, of course, you know, and I come there as a human being like, yes, there's, there's suffering. I mean, even Jesus said like, in this world, you're going to have trouble. There's a lot of pain. There's like a lot of suffering. And I'm like, yes, like that first hooks my soul in. It's like, yeah, I want to, you know, what's the answer to all of this? And the cause of suffering is my grasping and thirsting after everything. We kind of have that well in Christianity, like my lust, you know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, like the, that lure of the world that we have to be free from. What the Buddha has for you is like insulin for your diabetes. And like, Jesus is just like, diabetes gone, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like I've just rewritten your DNA or like I fixed your insulin gland it's always just whack-a-mole with your symptoms. So both are saying this sort of the same thing, but first of all, God wants to come, not have you completely destroy your desires. He wants to like redeem them, make them holy and like fulfill them completely. Have you live in the goodness of all these desires he's created? There's a good creation that you're supposed to live in. And what about the difference between Christian focus on engagement of God and the people around us versus detachment that seems to be the focus of Hinduism and Buddhism. Yeah. Well, you know, and there's different schools of it. Zen is really in the community. Like you do all this practice in community. Mm. Theravada Buddhism, which is like a lot in Southeast Asia, is very individualistic. It's just you on your journey of meditation to go be singularly yourself be united to God. Whereas Mahayana Buddhism is, they believe there's all these angelic beings that are coming to help you on your journey. And that your goal is you go to enlightenment or the edge of enlightenment, and then you turn around and come back and you come back as semi-enlightened being to help everybody else. So, you know, you have these different kind of strands within that. Some are very individual focused, some are community focused. Like we all practice this together to kind of generally become more loving. Zen talks about this thing called meta, which is basically if I just constantly think good thoughts about people, like it'll change my thinking. If I just think 
constantly am like, oh, peace to that person, peace to that person, peace to that person. If I say that a million times in my head, I, my attitude might start changing towards that person, but mm. it never solves the problem. We talk about human sin. What happened in the fall? We got disconnected from God. We stopped trusting him. We had this angst in us. All the effects of sin are just our lust and thirst for things to fulfill us that only God can fulfill. So, you know, all these things, they're talking about very similar things. And if you really get into like Genesis and the cosmology, it, in the details, it's so similar. We think, oh, this crazy pantheon of Hindu gods. And even in Buddhism, you have like the same pantheon going on. But the Bible talks about you have Yahweh Elohim. And then you have all the other Elohim under Yahweh. And Elohim is just like a spiritual being. It's like, you know, in the beginning of God's creating, you know, he was there and then he created all these other beings before he created us, like cherubim, seraphim, angels, and they're all like up in the heavenly realms doing stuff. Mm. So Satan rebels, takes a bunch of angels with him. The watchers have sex with human women. They lust after the human women. God sent the flood to wipe them all out. And all Satan and his cronies who have been like banished from heaven have taken over the world and set up like principalities and powers. So, you know, the real, the whole biblical story is God's righteousness coming in under a cosmos that's ruled by the power of sin and Satan. It's not that different mm. from the Hindu idea or the Buddhist idea. I'm going to go down on maybe a little Joe Rogan rabbit hole with some of this stuff, but <laughs> it started really like popping out to me. Okay, so cherubim are a step up from the angels. They guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. They sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant. They're on the veils in the tabernacle. They're like these human animal morph giant beings. Like Ezekiel, they're like wheels covered in eyes. They have bulls and eagles heads. And the word seraphim, which you hear a lot in like the Greek and Russian Orthodox. So that word seraph means a fiery serpent. And Isaiah 6 goes into God's throne room. He, he says, I saw seraphim, meaning they looked like angel humans on fire. They're on fire with the zeal of God, but they're fiery serpents. It's the same word used when the serpents come in Sinai and bite all the people. It's the same word used for the serpent in Genesis that comes to Eve. All variations of the same word. So I don't know. In my mind, I think like, okay, so we know that from scripture that Satan was like a worshiping angel that was banished from heaven because he wanted to become like God. Daniel 7, he'll speak out against the Most High. Isaiah 6, 2, God is above the seraphim. Isaiah 14, you know, pomp and music of your harps. And down to Sheol, have you fallen from heaven, morning star? It's like all over, revelation and everything. So you have in this cosmology, you have the supreme deity, all of his created half semi deities. And then you have like these fallen evil deities. And then you have these Elohim that are also like winged, fiery mm. serpent angels. And so if we look at all the other ancient civilizations around ancient Israel, the Egyptians, they had these beings that were half man, half serpent that judge you when you die. And there were these primordial beings that are like these beings. You look at King Tut's face mask, there's a little snake on his thing because that has to do with these beings mm. that when you die, they judge your soul. Wow. If you go to ancient Hinduism and Buddhism, there are these things called Nagas. And there are these serpent deities that are like primordial and that interact with humans. And mm. they are mortal enemies of these things called the Garuda, which are these like bird beasts that carry the throne of God on them. And think of Ezekiel. The cherubim, they're like animal, bird, human things, and they carry God's throne around. And then you have like, even in ancient Greece, Zeus creates women, and then he lusts after them. And he basically just, the entire Greek mythology is Zeus going around like raping women and creating these giants like Heracles and stuff. That's like the watchers lusted after the women on earth, had sex with them and created warrior giants. Hmm. And even Brahma is depicted, you know, the supreme deity is depicted as having four heads and he has four heads, 
there's a few different stories, but one of the reasons is he gets cursed by Vishnu because he creates women and he lusts after them so much, he can't stop staring at this woman he's lusted after, so he gets cursed to have four heads. And Vishnu appears to him on this giant heavenly stairway as a pillar of fire and curses him to have four heads. I'm just saying, like, it's not like these wildly different creation stories or cosmologies happening. Yeah. You know, it's like uniform throughout the entire Near East, going into the East, you know, even Greek stuff. And, you know, if you read historians, they say that Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity all kind of came around around the same time, mm. even in Greece, Platonic philosophy. I forgot the exact name for it. They call these ages of different types of belief. And they say everyone left kind of these uniform pagan religions to pursue these more philosophical approaches to life. So in Greece, you had Platonism and Stoicism. In India, you had Buddhism and Taoism came around. They try and lump Christianity in there that, you know, it was a more spiritual, esoteric form of these original pagan religions, which are all the same. I mean, you go to Zoroastrianism and Babylonians, they have their own winged, angelic, demonic figures. So what I'm just trying to say is we think now, 2,000 years later, that they're all so different. But if you go back to like Genesis, and even if you want to understand like Jesus's message, he's talking about this same reality, that there's this three-tiered, there's the heavens above, there's the firmament, there's the earth, and then there's like the deep or Sheol or the waters below. And there's these principalities and powers that he's now come and put in subjection under his feet. And when you announce the kingdom of God, you're announcing that Jesus has now come and taken back the earthly realm from the authority of Satan and his demons and now rules over all these realms of reality. It's not so different from all these other religions. It's like the same story. Okay, Tom, you've done an excellent job showing the overlaps. The word I get is there's a cross-pollination of Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism. And Buddhism just sounds to me like Hinduism packaged for the simple man. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, how do I make it more accessible? The Buddha is like, okay, this is too hard. I'm just going to make it simple. Well, I'll say one thing. Someone did visit the Buddha under that tree. So if you know much about like typology, it's this idea that there are these biblical design patterns and like biblical theology gets into this a lot, that there are these themes and biblical design patterns that are repeated over and over. So I want to like take that and put it on Buddhism real quick. So the Buddha is sitting under this tree and who comes and visits the Buddha? Well, the king of the Nagas, the serpent king comes and puts himself as a canopy over the Buddha to protect him from rain mm. and then bows down, worships the Buddha. So you have this cosmic storyline of a divine tree, a divine human being, and a serpent. Like, here we are again. Mm. It's the same story all over again, except a very different outcome. Well, it's, it's actually kind of the same outcome. I think in my mind, I don't think that's by chance that the same story keeps getting told. And just like the serpent talked to Eve in the garden, statements of truth that kind of draw you in at this deep level, and then like a little twist of a lie, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That doesn't actually get you to the answer of the truth. It's like it takes you way off base into some... Completely off base. Like eternal striving and suffering. That cosmology that all these religions are talking about are real. But like I said, you know, Hinduism kind of states the problem, like we are eternally separated from God and we have to go in this cosmic kind of journey to get back into union with God. And Buddhism offers one path to get there, but there's zero assurance of your salvation. And even the most sacred Hindu text, the verse from that text is, surrender exclusively unto him with your whole being and by his grace, you will attain perfect peace and the eternal abode. It's like not that different, but there are these little differences that take you way off base. It's like you're one degree off mm -hmm. or like go off the cliff somewhere. They all appeal to the exact same part of you. And in some ways, they all tell you the same story of what this problem is and sort of slightly, you know, they have some different theologies. But we talk about Jesus. It's a 100% assurance of salvation. And this is the door to go through. 
here's the problem. You're separated from God. Here's the answer. And this is how you get there. And once you're there, you can have a 100% assurance of salvation instead of, I basically am going to have to sit here, go sit in a cave and just meditate and relinquish all my attachments forever. And it's never going to give me any assurance of salvation. There's no promise there. And think what Jesus offers. And that's the spiritual body of the supreme deity is the caste system. It's like divinely ordained in the universe. Well, the body of Christ, there's no slave or free or man or woman or Greek or this. It's wiped out. And those at the bottom are first and equal with everybody else. So here's a new spiritual body. God's true spiritual body is the perfect equanimity. Wow. Which is one reason why Hindu countries are so against Christianity, because all of a sudden the untouchables who are sweeping the gutters are equal with the high Brahmin class. It's so offensive. It's the same story in pharisaical Second Temple Judaism. They're like, oh, these Gentiles and these tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, don't let them touch me. And he's like, guess what? They're first to the wedding banquet. So it's such a message of liberation for these people. It's so similar. But it's like everyone agrees that you're striving. There's this element of God's grace even built into the Hindu religion. And even Buddhism admits like, you know, there's no assurance of this. It's just a never ending thing. And maybe, <laughs> maybe you get there, but you're, then you're still kind of stuck in the, the cycle. Mm. Whereas we talk about that in Christianity, if you go to Christ, you're completely broken out of the cycle of sin, you know, and death, the law of sin and death. It's like, you're out. This is the way out for anyone, regardless of any faith background. So for you, Tom, you've been exposed to all these different religions, especially these three and more. Yeah. Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, Christianity. And you were actually pretty interested and pretty down the path of going down Hinduism and Buddhism, especially, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the turning point for you where Christianity became the one? The one that you could follow, the one that you can believe in, is it just because that it answered the question with a singular answer saying Jesus is the way? I, I think that came later. I mean, I, I met Jesus. Yeah. You know, I had radical, radical, sovereign encounters with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never found that anywhere else. And, and were they experiential encounters that led you to believe that Jesus is true? Or was it encounters with Jesus directly that said, I am meeting with Jesus right now. Therefore, Jesus is real. And, and he downloaded or imparted something on you to make you a believer. Well, I had some initial experiences that, that got me headed in the right direction. You know, I did have some like radical encounters. And then going to church, I realized who that was. And I experienced God's presence and I, it was just everything in my soul was like, this is the truth. And I did, you know, in like the book of Acts where all these people that are practicing all these pagan witchcraft things and esoteric practices, bring all their books and like burn them. I did that in my yard right, right after I went and <laughs> took every single- Your whole library of- I took all, all of it and threw Buddhist. it and just threw it and burned it all. And I was like, I, I found what I was looking for. So suddenly you knew Christianity was the truth or through a series of experiences and revelations. Yeah. I mean, I started going back to church. What's the verse where Paul's writing and saying, you know, you're practicing all of these strict practices, but they don't actually have any effect to, mm. you know, free you from sensual temptations. <laughs> it sounds like Buddha's experience with Hinduism. Yeah, exactly. And, and Paul says that, but, you know, I started coming to church and all of a sudden, these problems like went away. Like all of a sudden I like didn't have the desire to like do these sins anymore. And I actually felt full of life and empowered. And I was like, wow, I spent my whole life doing these other things. They never fixed the problem. They never reduced temptation, squashed it, kind of squashed my brain function. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it didn't actually fi ever fix the problem. So what was the timeline of how long you were going deeper and deeper and steeping into Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, and then you started going to church and then you burned all the books. I mean, I was like in, in and out of kind of high church as a, as a kid. And then I think fifth grade, I had a friend that introduced me to Buddhism, which got me interested. Just like my childhood interest in Christianity wasn't really substantial. It was like a very surface intrigued by it. Like a child would be at a child's level. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't, you know, I didn't really understand what it was about. 
I kind of forgot about all that for a while. And then I remember I got introduced to like meditation and yoga at this like therapeutic program I went to in high school. And, you know, it gave me some relief. I was like, wow, this is nice. You know, I sat on top of a rock and breathed for a while. And I was like, that's nice. You know, (laughs) I feel some relief. (laughs) That's that's good. Mm. You know, (laughs) (laughs) thank you. Healing rock. Yeah. But actually on that rock, I also had like a sort of encounter with God that didn't have anything to do with my breathing techniques. So then when I got in college, I started to do like a mindfulness group. And that's when I was studying different religions. I was like in, you know, all these academic classes studying Buddhism and Zen and Taoism and all this stuff. Okay. So you're studying this in university. Yeah. And they had like a meditation group and I became one of the meditation leaders. I'm leading all these meditations. And then after I, when I got sober, I got the help of a therapist that was way off into the new age, but we did neuro-linguistic repatterning and self-hypnosis and deep mindfulness meditation stuff, like all this stuff that's all the Eastern Zen-informed therapy stuff, which really helped me actually get out of like a really nasty, dark place. It didn't, again, didn't solve the problem, but it helped me break free from like psychosis, basically. So like I'm saying, you know, these are, it's like good therapy, but it doesn't fix the problem or answer any of these deep longings of my soul. It gives you some Mm. techniques to like ease the suffering but it's endless. And it, you know, there's a one in 50 billion chance that you get there only by God's grace too. All my striving doesn't do anything. And I'm still doing all this stuff. And I'd also like gone off into the new age, which is like all these things. People in the West have taken all these different faith things and kind of smashed them into one and Mm -hmm. jumbled them up and kind of mixed it up with like energy healing and crystals and stuff. Went down the rabbit hole with that. And once again, I started going to church and none of those things were helping. And I was going to church and these things, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm free. I don't have to do all this junk. Immediately I was like, yeah, okay. Thank God I don't have to do that anymore. So at what age did you go back to church again after trying all these things? Probably around 2016, 17, late twenties, late twenties. And then your focus on Christianity became complete within how long of going back? Probably a little under a year. Wow. So a lifetime of looking at all these different things and then a year of going back to church and you were one, you were done. Yeah. I just was like, yeah, I don't know more of that. Since I've gotten into so much inner healing prayer and deliverance, and it's like, there's so much stuff to like unwind coming out of those worlds, you know, just all these, all sorts of weird agreements with stuff. And it's had so many ill effects on me and so confusing, kind of this endless rabbit hole you go down with this stuff. It's tiring. It's very tiring. In the West, like we, we kind of circle back around to like people doing yoga. They, they, it's a deeply spiritual thing where you're like trying to yoke yourself with these Hindu gods and subdue your flesh and your carnal desires and bring your soul in union and unity through this striving physical exercise into like union with God. But You also get indwelt with like a kundalini spirit. And I think of it like, you know, a lot of these practices, it's like trying to connect to the internet without a firewall. You're just plugging in, Mm. let whatever come on in. So I think a lot of people in the West just view yoga as a set of exercises and postures. So do you think it's possible to separate the wellness part of it and the exercise part of it from the mantras and separate it from the direct tie to Hinduism? I mean, I don't know why, like, why do you have to sit in a warrior pose? You know I mean, like I, I, I can send you 50, 50 YouTube core, you know, like, you know, core workout videos where you do all the same stuff, but I'm not like holding that posture is supposed to like connect you with the deity associated with like the posture. Mm. Is that true for every posture? Like, you know, everyone starts with downward dog. Is, is that also like a very specific posture? I don't know enough about like the individual poses, but the goal is to yoke yourself with Brahma and to like, mm. you know, it's kind of this Gnostic thing. Like I'm doing all these postures so that my mind, soul, body, and spirit are all in harmony with Brahma. I don't need to do that to be in harmony with the Holy Spirit. I just ask my father <laughs> and he's, if I believe in Jesus, the spirit's in me and I have access without any striving, you know? I mean, yes, Mm -hmm. spiritual disciplines help, but I can also do a spiritual discipline sitting on my chair and be in the presence of God. You know, I don't have to like 
work so hard? If I want to do some exercise, I'm sure there's plenty of core workout exercises that are the same thing, you know, like doing a plank or doing different positions. I do all that stuff. It's like I'm missing something. So I need to go fill it with Hinduism, fill it with this practice that is deeply spiritual. It's like, I'm not going to go to a mosque and pray the Salah, but just pray to Jesus, but just go there and do all the bowing and the everything and say all the words, or I'm not going to go to a Hindu temple and ring bells and pray to Jesus. Yeah. The major differences. We've heard all of the similarities. Sounds like the major differences though, is not karma, but Christ's work. Reincarnation versus the hope of heaven, right? Yeah. So reincarnation versus heaven and then karma versus Christ's sacrifice because mm-hmm. of his love. Yes. Sounds like that's the, the major differences, but everything else there's, it, it's like you can uh, copy and paste. Yeah. And I just, I say all the differences. So, you know, you know, there's so many touch points that if you want to approach somebody with this background that you can talk about, it's like, there's all these truths and then like a bunch of lies and you just have to filter that out. I mean, it's not that different from like, you read Paul's letters and he's talking to like either Christians who are trying to bring the law back in or people are trying to bring like Hellenism and Greek stuff and like mix, mix it up with Christianity. It's all the arguments, like I was reading Ephesians 1 and Colossians, parts of Romans, it's the same argument. And it's the same reason Moses wrote the Pentateuch. It was like a counter apologetic for all these people living in all these cultures and like, you know, the East. He's like, let me just set the record straight. Mm, nice. But like, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't need to spend lifetimes paying off my karmic debt. Like Jesus paid the sacrifice for all of my sins. That debt is paid. I am good. And I now have full access. I don't have to strive at all to like have access to God. And I'm freed from like the cycle of sin and death. And I have 100% assurance of my salvation. Like 100%. And I have access to God's consolation and love and his presence anytime, anywhere just by asking and just receive it by faith. What a weight off. I'm not stuck in Amen. all this stuff. Well, amen, Tom. Thank God. I have a Buddhist background mm-hmm. and a quick testimony. Mm. I came to faith at 19, as most of you have heard. And it wasn't until 15 years later, I didn't know how much Buddhism was still steeped into my identity. And I had a prayer session in Taiwan with a friend of mine. And also Sarah was there. And make a long story short, I was delivered of Siddhartha spirit, Siddhartha. Wow. And ever since then, I could say, I need help. Before I was delivered of Siddhartha, I could never say, I need help. Or I could never come from a place of weakness. Where does that come from? Why does the spirit of Siddhartha have that effect? Yeah, because Buddhism is really about carrying all of the burdens of the world yourself and even separating yourself from the world, Mm -hmm. the suffering. I see. That's part of the philosophy. Mm. It's not, I need to depend on somebody else. I need a mediator and I need sustenance. I need help. I myself separate myself and I need to carry the burdens Mm. of the suffering of the world. Mm. And you stuff it into your own heart. Wow. So even though I was a Christian and I, it was still like deep in me, it still impacted my Christianity. And I didn't know the nuance of that. I didn't know that the generations of Buddhism in my lineage and my ancestors, and then Siddhartha, it was a part of, you could say our genetics or the way we thought, our ideology, and the way we operated where we couldn't ask for help. So ever since, it was really crazy. After I was delivered, I had to repent of Siddhartha. And I felt different after that. Yeah. It turned towards Christ. It all comes down to the same old cosmic story. In Hinduism, you are on a journey to become God. Buddhism, you are saving yourself to become an enlightened being. It's like man becoming God. And it's right, it's right back to the garden. 
it's that fundamental thing of the temptation is like you save yourself to become God. That's the twist drawn in with these, the same cosmology and deep spiritual truths, the same yearning and longings for your heart. But it's like, there's this little twist that like, you're going to make yourself God by your own striving or some trick. I can follow this little system and I'm going to become God. I could eat this fruit. I'm going to become like God. Woohoo. You know what I mean? Mm, like the serpent, you will be yeah. like gods. Yeah. Well, let's close out with the gospel. Yeah. And the Hinduism, there's, I think there's good news as well that we're not just bodies, but we have souls, right? Cause I know yeah. Hindus believe in the soul mm -hmm. and that's good news. Cause we all know that's true. And all religions, there's good, but the ultimate good though of Christianity, what is the good news of Christianity that sets it apart, Tom? There is one God, Yahweh. He is the Yahweh Elohim. He is the God above all other gods. And he created all things. And he did also create other spiritual beings in his heavenly realm. Some of those beings rebelled against him and were cast to the earth to, to rule his principalities and powers. God created a garden, a place on earth where humans who were indwelt with his spirit could live in union with him, where heaven and earth were one, and they could live in harmony and union and be fulfilled and sustained by God forever to expand his kingdom and build his creation. But those humans were deceived by the devil, and they were kicked out of the garden and eternally separated from God because of their sin and their disobedience. This one God idea, Tom. Yeah. Can we say the good news of Christianity, okay, there's one God. So it's like Vishnu and Krishna and uh, what were the Shiva that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. It's all one. So Brahma is the one God. <laughs> Can we say it like that? The one God, they're all, it's actually, you don't, it's not Vishnu, not Shiva, but all of them are swallowed up by Brahma, just one God. And then Krishna, who's the God of compassion and tenderness and love, Krishna is actually the core of who Brahma is. <laughs> no, 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 no. Can't say it like that. Great. Because Krishna was also like a, a sneaky trickster. Okay. And God is also sovereign from creation. You know, Krishna also had like wore many masks and had many disguises and had 1600 wives. Brahma. I got it. Nice. See, this is what I was trying to draw out. Brahma lusted after his female creation, which makes him actually look more like the Nephilim. And the watchers mm -hmm. in Genesis 6, then mm -hmm. Yahweh Elohim. So people who don't have a relationship with Yahweh are experiencing the kind of intermediary realm of all these Elohim, these lower angelic beings that are like battling and wreaking havoc on the earth. And there's demons and principalities everywhere. I don't think it's by chance that all of these other gods like resemble in their features you know, and all these other things, the divine beings described in the Bible. It's not by chance. They're all tapping into the same reality because it's true, but they're either trying to figure it out on their own and create their mm. own path to get to God, or they've fallen under the deception of these principalities and powers. Like everyone's minds are veiled on earth. Wow. What comes to me is God is not made in our image. No. But we're made in the image of God. Yeah. And he's sovereign from his creation. Yeah. He's sovereign from his creation. He created us. And so the good news, well, there's a few parts to it. The earthly realm that since the fall or since before the fall, since Satan's rebellion has been sort of under the control of the evil one, God himself, Yahweh, came as Jesus Yeshua, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, Yeshua bar Joseph showed up as this Jewish man and lived a perfectly sinless life, was put on a cross and killed for our sins to wipe out all sinful debt that every human being owes, died, descended to the depths, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And by doing that, he paid the entire sin debt of all humanity. He took over the rebellious earthly realm from the power of Satan and all of his cronies and defeated them and is going around declaring that the kingdom of God has come, that he's the Lord of the heavens, the earth and below. Like he's now has all authority. Nice. You know, over all of these now. Nice. He has taken back the world, like mission complete, where Adam and Eve failed, like mission is complete now. And 
All we have to do to have 100% assurance of salvation is believe that Jesus is Lord, that he's risen from the dead, and that he's taken our sins. Hallelujah. Wow. And we can call on him and have full assurance of that and be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live godly lives and fulfill the mission that, that Adam and Eve failed to help God bring his kingdom to the whole earth. Amen. Amen, Tom. Preach it, Pastor Tom. And then you know what? I keep getting that verse, we're made in the image of God, that all humanity is made in the image of God. Yeah. And that, because in the Hindu system, it's the caste system. No one carries the divine image. It's maybe it, because the caste system, mm -hmm. there's the intellectual, spiritual leaders, the, the Brahmin and the, what is it? Kshatriya, the warriors, yeah. Yeah, Kshatriya, the warriors, the, the Vasyas, the, the, yeah, the merchants, producers, yeah. the Shudras, the unskilled laborers. So the four main caste systems, it's hierarchical. But scripture, Genesis says, all human beings are made in the image of God, basically saying God loves all yeah. and carries the divine image. And that's good news. And that caste system, literally, like they, they have a picture of Brahma. It's like the priests are his head and the warriors are his chest and the... Other ones are his arms and legs. And then like, I don't remember, but it's like mm -hmm. the worst part of the body is, you know, the untouchables, you know? And it's mm -hmm. like the real body of God's actual body is just total equality of doesn't matter what caste or background or male or female or whatever. We're all equally in the image of God, like part of God's body. Like, Amen. like what good news. And I love that. What, that's so cool. Yeah, that's good news. Whether you're affluent, born into an affluent, wealthy, yeah, there's no hierarchy, philosopher's family, or you grew up in a peasant's yeah. home, uneducated, you can have the access to God, and you're considered a, a co-heir, yeah. with Christ, yeah. and you're a son and daughter of God, yeah, through Christ. That is such a good news message. And then Jesus is going to come back and rid the world of suffering. There's the answer. There'll be no more tears. We don't have to like put these band-aids on. It's not like we just have to spend our whole lives trying to unattach ourselves from suffering. There will actually be judgment and redemption and healing and nice reconciliation. You know, that's all going to happen. That's what I yearn for. Not just like, oh my gosh, it's all so overwhelming. I just have to kind of sit in my room and detach myself from it. Mm, wow. Like there, it's all going to so be relatable. solved and, and fulfilled and all my deepest longings are going to be fulfilled. Hey, can you touch on the Jubilee, the year of Jubilee yeah. versus the way the karma dominates in Hinduism versus the year of Jubilee? Yeah. And then we can close in prayer. If I'm right, I think, you know, in the Old Testament in Israel, the year of Jubilee was every seven years. and they would stop planting and doing crops and they would let the earth rest and heal. They would can't also cancel every debt, which is great. Uh, that'd be great if someone every seven years someone paid off like my mortgage and my credit card, you know? But like all of your, if we're going to relate to Hinduism, all of your cosmic debt based on your actions, right or wrong, your sinful debt, the debt that you owe God is wiped out. So I guess that's our prayer, that if you hear this, your entire debt is paid by Jesus. We bless you that this is the year your debt is paid. You don't have to strive anymore to fulfill this debt. It's been completely paid for you, and you can enter heaven with the Lord, heaven with bliss. God is not just an impersonal energy or force or cosmic thing. It's like a person. He loves you and he cares about you and you can relate to him and have a relationship with him. And he has paid the whole debt completely. Like you're free, you're free to go debt paid. Amen. Did you say year of Jubilee was every seven years? I think it was, it's, it? it's the 50th year because it's seven, seven times seven, 49. And then it's the 50th year. Okay. So I know there are sevens in there. Yeah. It's actually the, it's the 50th year when they've had seven years of Sabbaths, mm -hmm. the year dedicated to rest, restoration of property, freeing people from debts, servitude, and slavery. So the 50th year is the year of Jubilee, which I think Christ in Luke chapter four, when he declares the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach good news of the poor, to set the captives free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I think he was declaring the year of Jubilee. Christ is the Jubilee for the world. And like the ultimate Jubilee, not like you're going to have to do Jubilee every 50 years. 
to the ultimate jubilee, like once and for all jubilee. Amen. Because even like even that system, when they set that up, still it's like a band aid on a gunshot wound. Every year you got to sacrifice that lamb. Keep going. The system wasn't meant to fix the problem at its core. A band aid on a shotgun wound. That's that's yeah. a great picture. Yeah. Well, let's pray. Tom, would you just pray for those that may have a Buddhist or Hindu worldview for them to come to know the God who loves Mm -hmm. and receive the good news? Yeah. That whoever wants to receive the good news, it's within reach right now. Yeah. Well, Heavenly Father, we just come before you in Jesus' name. We know that there is an anchor of hope that goes from the veil down to us, and it's Jesus Christ. We know that there is a firm foundation to stand on, that as much as things are changing, there is permanence, and there is unending, undying love in God for all of us and for you. Thank you, Lord, that you came to earth as a man so that we could relate with you, that we could know that you were a man who suffered on our behalf, that you know our pain and our suffering. You know the, the pain and suffering that we experience in this world. And you came and you lived a perfect life so that we don't have to strive anymore. And that when you died and you resurrected, Lord, that you paid the entire debt of every mistake we've ever made. So we don't have to strive any longer to receive your love. We can just believe that you are who you say you are, that you are God, that you are Lord. That if we receive your sacrifice, that if we believe in your sacrifice by faith, the entire slate can be wiped clean and that we can know 100% that we are saved, that we're going to heaven, that we'll have eternity and bliss with you forever and ever and ever, where we won't have to destroy our desires, but they'll be all fulfilled, that we won't have to separate ourselves from suffering, but there will be complete justice for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just, if you're listening to this, I bless you in Jesus' name right now, the Spirit will come open the eyes of your heart, your spiritual eyes, and open your understanding to just experience Jesus and receive the power of his love. And to know that all you need to do to be saved forever is to just believe in him. He could be your friend and your Lord forever and ever and ever, that he's so close and he loves you so much and that you don't have to strive. You don't have to wonder which God to worship what practice to do. You don't have to strive and strain and and bend your body to receive eternity. You don't have to extinguish all of your desires and separate yourself from all the things that you love. God's given you those things and he wants to fulfill those things. So if you could just reach out to Jesus, pray to him, ask him to reveal himself to you. Tell him you love him, that you believe who he is and what he did. And just ask him to come into your heart. You can start this journey with him for the rest of your life. So just bless you in Jesus' name to receive him and speak to him. And just tell him that, Lord, I love you. I believe you. I want to receive you into my life and my heart. So just come, Holy Spirit. Dwell in me and empower me to do the things that I can't do, to love you and follow you and know you. Thank you, Jesus. You are Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He is roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and